So without that, you, uh, my first and foremost, I'm truly, truly thankful to one and each of you expert panel. The thanks is not just for this meeting, but how you made my webinars uh, glow and shine. It can't be because of me. It's because of the kind of inputs you gave. So my namaskar or salutes to one and all of you for making ARC what it is. Thank you so much. And um, uh, without adieu, because you know, it's really tight. Six minutes, when I say keep it, please, six minutes, you won't believe I was so impressed with the Glockma team, the way they did it, six minutes, six minutes. We could have two minutes discussion. Do not any say anything extra. We just want management strategies, when and what, how it has to be done for the audience. Our first speaker is Dr. Arun Samprati, who is the director of the Samprati Eye Hospital and Screen Center. And of course, uh, an extremely experienced and a most uh, complacent and a calm Dr. Arun Samprati, whom we have great pride in knowing. And he is going to be talking on a very important topic, refractive errors in children, the art of prescribing glasses and signs of halting progression. Preferred practice guidelines. So first of all, I would like to thank Madam for giving me this opportunity. Uh, refractive errors in children, it's actually the most common uh, problem we see in Dr. our Dr. Rashmin, practice. could you take the first? Uh, we all know the pediatric refraction is not so easy because of the uncooperative child. Please, so, audience to be quiet, please. The door to be closed. So why at all we need to correct the refractive error? First and more foremost is to improve the visual acuity. Uh, decrease the strabismus, enhance the binocular vision and relieve the asthenopia. We all know children are born uh, with the hypermetropic error and uh, as they grow older, the emetropization happens. Assessment of ref refractive error is mainly subjective and objective, but in children we rely more on the objective methods because subjective methods may not be reliable. Determining the refractive errors needs an alert child because often we see uh, refraction under anesthesia. So that's actually is the last resort unless you're not able to get a refraction because if you're refracting an alert child, you're refracting the fovea. Otherwise, you may refract some other part of the retina. These are very useful pediatric uh, trial frames and trial racks for the refraction. And as we all know, the importance of cycloplegic refraction cannot be undermined. Uh, it's also important to remember that refractive error correction alters the strabismus and always may not be for the better. So sometimes you may have a uh, opposite effect. So that's why it's always very important to check the muscle balance in each and every child before you do give it. the refractive correction. So hyperopic corrections, they decrease the esotropia, whereas they can increase the exotropia, whereas myopic corrections will decrease the exotropia and increase the esotropia. So this has to be remembered anytime when you're prescribing a glass to any child. So prescribing guidelines, I am sure you all know about this one. Uh, I think myopia of more than 1.5 in an older child should be corrected. Uh, less than two years, uh, more than four adapter to be corrected. And uh, hyperopic correction is little more tricky because there are a lot of other factors which influence, just not the refractive error. The age of the child, the amount of hypermetropia, the accommodative abilities, and the presence or absence of strabismus. And we also have to remember this high hypermetropes, like you say no, plus yeah. eight, plus nine you get. So these people have very subnormal accommodation. So that's why they have to be given a full correction and we should not be undercorrecting in these children. And accommodative targets are extremely essential and without that you can miss the isotropia and you may not give the proper correction for the hypermetropia. So whenever you have a hypermetropia with isotropia, we always try to give the full correction. Whereas whenever it's associated with an exotropia, we undercorrect. But Please remember here, just because exotropia is there and hypermetropia is, no, is there, doesn't mean that you, have no, you should not give glasses. So it should be given and you have to ensure that the visual acuity is uh, optimal. Only then the exotropia will get better. So just because exotropia is there, you should not be, not be correcting hypermetropia, but we all be undercorrect the hypermetropia. Astigmatism, any astigmatism more than 1.5 should be corrected. And uh, anisometropia, very important uh, to remember the correction, uh, the proper correction has to be given, especially in anisohypermetropia because these children are highly prone for amblyopias. So even a one adapter hyperopic difference can cause a very severe amblyopia. So a word about the control of uh, progression. 
uh, progressive myopia, as we all know, has become a big problem now. Mm -hmm. And uh, the most important reason is uh, the myopic macular degeneration has been hypothesized to become the most common cause of irreversible blindness in the future. So that's why we should focus on preventing the progress of uh, myopia. So the currently available mo uh, modalities for uh, uh, preventing the progression is, uh, the, as we all know, the spectacle and the contact lenses, but now there is more emphasis on the environmental and the pharmacological uh, modifications. Environment, at least two hours of outdoor activities has been uh, shown to have a protective effect because uh, it's supposed to release dopamine, which actually helps in preventing the increase in elongation of the eyeball. Uh, bifocals and uh, progressive are also being used, and this is especially useful in children who have an accommodative lag. So there the progression of myopia can be controlled by using progressive uh, glasses. Uh, the recently there has been a lot of interest about this DIMS lenses, the defocus incorporated multiple segments. So here what happens is there is a central uh, treatment zone and around that, the, the sorry, the central clear zone would give the good visual acuity. Around that uh, there is a uh, uh, hyperopic zone. So basically what has happened in the one of the hypothesis for myopia is the peripheral defocus theory wherein the central rays focus on the retina when you correct the uh, myopia, but the peripheral rays are supposed to focus behind the retina. So that is inducing the hypermetropia and thereby it results in progression of uh, myopia. Uh, ortho K lenses have also been used. Uh, I no, don't have much experience about this ortho K lenses. And atropine has been the most promising. 0.01% uh, uh, gives the best results with minimal side effects. So atropine works not through the accommodative uh, mechanism, but through the uh, anti-mascarinic, uh, sorry, non-mascarinic and a direct influence on the uh, scleral fibroblast. So in conclusion, outdoor time has been the most promising intervention for uh, preventing the progression of myopia. And there is been a very consistent evidence that 0.01% atropine gives excellent results. And uh, other things like uh, ortho K also can be used. But most importantly, we have to keep abreast of the ongoing studies so that we know what is the uh, latest one and uh, give the best to our patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arun. Uh, excellently presenting, uh, especially about uh, what we need to look out for for preventing progression in uh, myopia. And this is a continuously evolving topic and we hope to learn f for uh, uh, preventing uh, progression for myopia. Any comments on and or any experience on uh, especially optical? We have, of course, now a good amount of experience on the pharmacological. So expert panel, any experience with the uh, DIMS spectacles particularly or the uh, Zeiss uh, Myo, Myo vision. We have so DIMS lens we are we are um, prescribing DIMS only uh, factor with DIMS is that um, some of the children take a little time to adapt to it so we must uh, tell them that it takes a little time to adapt to the DIMS, DIMS lens and it's a little expensive but yes, if you it make sure it is. in a package uh, it works out a little cheaper. Yeah. But one point I would like to make, you should measure the lag of accommodation. Yes, that's very important. Before you children. prescribe. It's very important. Very important. So if you have an accommodative lag, what would be your preferred intervention? I would probably give a progressive, progressive. along with, uh, along yes. with the atrophy. Then Dr. Pradeep, what? The interesting part is that accommodation lag we are talking. But atropine, but atropine, atropine uh, causes a competition lag yeah, and I treats. Guess. So there is a, we have to be Although, I mean, uh, although uh, one, in fact, uh, when we were, when we had discussed it also, we had said that atropine in these patients, so uh, it's, it's, you know, you can argue both ways because studies have not shown any change in accommodation uh, so on a low dose atropine. We I'm haven't found. Accommodation lag is something which we may not be implying so much importance. Yeah. Then so Dr. Pradeep, I'll ask you, what would be your baseline workup when you, as a patient with myopia has been diagnosed for the first time, like for the audience, what extra so things? For the first time, I mean, one is the uh, proper refraction under the right cycloplegia for age. So less than five, we are insisting on atropine ointment used three days prior. For six and above, we are uh, using homotropine. Some people use cyclopentolate. And up in usually first time, even in adults, maybe 18, 20 years also, we are preferring homotropine for the first time because they may be having pseudomyopia otherwise. That is what we should do. Secondly, axial length, if you are do doing any treatment, then axial length should be done. Yeah. Uh, accommodation lag yes, uh, may be done. I mean, yes. that's questionable. Probably even hours of near work, indoor work, family history. So all those history also and all those are the details. Right. Yes. 
wonderful we got all our answers so uh, uh, of course a commutative lag is something we should measure yeah. and a baseline axial length yes. uh, and an axial length and on every uh, annual follow up also because we've seen the discrepancy in the effect on refractive error and the axial length being there particularly for the pharmacological treatment at the present in the currently available so it's important that you uh, kind of document the axial length change because effect in the end that's what we are looking for not refractive error but uh, the axial length change so we'll move and on to the one more there is the esophoria esophoria and yeah, there is esophoria commutative lag is both these are very very important, important yes. and uh, that's why we always insist that uh, you know pediatric ophthalmologists should be the ones who should be dispensing treatment for progressive myopia and not others <laughs> thank you <laughs> so uh, thank you uh, uh, thank you arun we'll go on to dr jitender jithani who will be talking on clinical evaluation of strabismus and documentation just a quick word on the previous one we should also document keratometry because we should be yeah. sure that it is axial myopia Absolutely. and not uh, curvature myopia Absolutely. so it is very important and if there is esophoria it is very easy to you know give progressive that would help anyway so coming back to my topic uh, at the outset i would like to thank uh, uh, yes. dr chitra ma'am for giving the opportunity and we will uh -huh. go straight to the topic because i think this is this is a very long topic it will i mean i will be speaking very quick so uh, what is strabismus and workup of strabismus basically what we do in this is we establish the presence uh, and the type of strabismus whether there is any presence of amblyopia or not amount of deviation for the management part and last but not the least is assessing binocular uh, status of the patient and uh, this is very very important in kids we we should be able to uh, know what is the fixation pattern of the kid and this is how we manage in pre verbal children central study maintained fixation and uh, so we come to the motor evaluation cover test cover test basically means uh, not just part of cover test but cover test encompasses almost all the tests so cover test includes cover uncover test alternate cover test present cover test simultaneous cover present cover test corneal reflection test is inspection so what what information we get out of it is the type of deviation whether it is coming from into out eso exo hypo hyper unilateral or whether it is alternate or not the amount of deviation the fixation pattern presence of latent nystagmus incommitent deviation if any depending on fixing right eye fixing left eye amount of deviation presence of amblyopia depending again on the fixation pattern and on the dominance of the eye and any associated dissociated vertical or horizontal deviation and for this we need as uh, dr arun rightly said we need a fixation target for near and distance a torch light is uh, only for corneal reflection test if we are planning to operate or planning to work up a strabismus patient we need to control the accommodation and that is only possible with accommodative target for near as well as for distance we need an occluder and a prism bar to manage to measure the amount of deviation corneal reflection test is a simple test Uh, it is meant only to get a gross idea what is going on because it is full of errors like you may end up into diagnosing a pseudo eso pseudo exo uh, you may not i mean uh, you may uh, have a high angle kappa or a low angle kappa and so but basically you have a gross idea which is the fixing eye so that helps you go to the cover test where where basically you cover the seemingly fixating eye it is very important to cover the fixating eye because if you cover the non fixing eye it doesn't give you any information so basically you cover the seemingly fixating eye and the response of non fixing eye is observed if it moves from out to in it is exo if it moves from in to out it is eso if it comes from up to down it is hypo uh, it if it comes from up to down it is hyper and if it comes from down to up it is hypo and then uh, this is how you notify them if there is intermittent exotropia you notify them at x Uh, bracket t and likewise if there is constant exo there is exophoria this is just a small animation to show a phoric deviation when uh, you know phoric deviations are actually latent deviation there is no manifest deviation both the eyes are straight so you cover any of the eye and then you move on to do an alternate cover test to break the fusion so that you can manifest the phoric deviation and then you have cover uncover test which means that once you have covered the seemingly fixating eye you're going to leave it which means that that would be that particular eye which was covered will be uncovered and what information this test gives you is whether it is a unilateral strabismus or an alternate strabismus which means that if the eye under cover has lost fixation and other eye has taken up the fixation when you uncover it if the other eye is still maintaining the fixation then it is an it is an alternate deviation 
and then if it leaves the fixation then it is a unilateral deviation so and then you have alternate cover test mainly for breaking the fusion mainly done for uh, foric deviations mainly done for latent deviations so this is uh, alternate cover test should not be done in all the cases because if you do an alternate cover test you are going to see an alternate trochia regardless of whatever is the deviation whether it is foric or uh, tropic so prism cover test here you you want to measure the amount of deviation and how do you do that you start putting prisms of progressively high power with apex towards the deviation now here you would put prism apex towards the deviation but when you note you note it with regards to the base so for isotropia you write base out mm -hmm. for exo you write base in and likewise for hyper and hypo and uh, here we are like if the if the eye is on the outer side you would put apex towards the deviation that is how to you have to remember it but when you when you record it you put base out base in and then there are uh, i mean this is okay so this is uh, this is about uh, fusional amplitudes so these are i mean this, <laughs> this is going to take some time uh, so fusional amplitudes you measure fusional amplitudes uh, convergence amplitude divergence amplitude and convergence amplitude you progressively take a prism bar and progressively start increasing base out prisms and there is a point of neutralization and then uh, sorry there is a point of breaking and then uh, you go back and then there is a point of recovery so that is how uh, uh, so this is how you this is how you note it i'll just come to the notations because that is what the topic was how do you note them so the notations for convergence amplitudes are breaking point uh, uh, a certain diapters 40 percent diapters and then there is a recovery point and normal convergence amplitudes are between 25 for breaking point and point for recovery is 20. so this is okay and then not like this no. so this was uh, so for ocular movements uh, we have we now uh, note them according to the millimeter of excursion but for routine uh, examinations most of us are still holding with minus 0 to minus 4 where 0 means that ocular motility is full and minus 4 that it is not moving beyond midline but we have started uh, measuring excursions so we note it in terms of millimeters and these are normal deviations just one uh, it's okay we don't take it because normal i have taken let us finish Thank you, uh, Dr. Jaspreet. A very, very uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Jitinder. A very, very uh, extensive topic you have covered. Uh, Dr. Pradeep, you know what? How frequently do you do uh, sensory testing in your patients? I with think I was just trying to come to that. That that is also a mandate. You should always do the one at least one sensory test. Bagolini's for knowing the suppression and near stereo te uh, testing. So, in, of course, manifest ESO, they won't be. So, you won't have to do stereo test. But in intermittent divergent squint, stereo test would be the uh, diagnostic uh, prognostic thing. So, you should do a proper uh, pri prism bar cover test after a proper cycloplegic refraction. That is one. Secondly, the torsion whenever required. You can go and for the it. motor things. And for the sensory, Bagolini glasses for knowing the suppression and the stereo testing. So, these are probably the uh, near... Essential measurement yeah. for both prism bar and cover the near distance measurement. So these are the must. What is your take on strabismus measurements in high powered glasses? So whenever you have high powered or uh, glasses, then you would have to use correction tables yes. in order to reach the correct deviation. Yes. Uh, we shall now go on to our uh, next speaker, Dr. Sujata Guha, is who is again a very popular and a highly experienced pediatric and neuro-ophthalmologist from Shankar Netralia, Kolkata, held at very high esteem there. And uh, we are truly lucky to have her. And she is going to be talking on a challenging topic, managing paralytic strabismus, preferred practice guidelines in six minutes. It's truly going to be a magic. <laughs> I'll have to plan, <laughs> replan my talks, make it very really short talks. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, Dr. Chitra, for inviting me to this very interesting <laughs> symposium. And... Uh, <laughs> Yes, um, I shall be talking on what you need to do, what you need to document, how you need to investigate, manage, and if you plan surgery, what should it be in this next six minutes. So working up, following uh, Dr. Jithani, you should have these few things as you document your case. The 
primary and the secondary deviation noted in prison diopters and the fixating eye, measurements of deviation in all gazes and tilts, the extraocular motility recorded in a scale of 0 to minus 4, both ductions and versions should be tested. You should do a forced duction test. In the initial part, you can differentiate between a restrictive and a paralytic strabismus if it is positive, that is if there is uh, a contracture. Towards the end, for managing, for, for uh, doing surgeries, you also should do the forced duction test. Force generation test to look at the tug. If there is absolutely no tug on your paralyzed muscle, that means it's truly paralyzed. If there is a weak tug, it means it's a <coughs> paretic muscle. Again, you will need this for planning surgery. The saccades al should also be recorded in paralytic strabismus. The saccades are basically slow, it is floating. In restrictive, you will have a good generation of brisk generation of saccades, but the extent is limited, something like a dog on a leash. Again, you should note the field of binocular single vision. Even if you can't plot it like this, you must have Look. a general idea as to where the patient is seeing double and the where the patient is seeing single. This is important because finally, you will want to bring your single vision into the primary and the down gaze, which is the most functional gaze of the patient. You should also look for presence of aberrant regeneration, especially in third nerve palsies. And sometimes these aberrant regeneration can be used very effectively to manage ptosis if you plan surgery. Again, diplopia and HES charting also should be in the records of your paralytic strabismus. The diplopia charting to see where exactly the double vis vision is maximum. The HES to see where your muscle is overacting and which is the underacting muscle. You should also do visual fields. A confrontation fields uh, 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 it should be the first line and if you find a defect in the confrontation, you should do uh, uh, Humphrey uh, perimetry. Now coming to investigations. The gold standard for investigation will be MRI brain orbit with contrast. If there is a third nerve palsy, you, can, you should add a MRA or a CTA. CTA is more sensitive for smaller aneurysms. Now, if you don't image, say for financial constraints, say you have a gut feeling, you will have a negative yield, you have to follow these patients closely. How closely? It should be weekly to look for progression and to look for any other cranial nerve involvement. If you suspect a microvascular mononeuropathy, you should also add these risk factors to the investigations. Blood pressure, sugars, lipids, blood work, especially ESR and CRP to rule out arteritic cranial nerve palsies. If you have bilateral involvement or multiple cranial nerve palsy and you have enhancement on gadolinium contrast MRI, you should also add a lumbar puncture to look for uh, uh, carcinoma and also infections. And also do a blood work to rule out infections and granulomatous inflammations. Now coming to the management. In the initial part, when it is acute, the management is mainly for reducing the diplopia. You can do that with occlusion of one of the sides of the, with glasses. You can do that with prisms. You can Botox, the antagonist, specially done for uh, six nerve palsy where we Botox the medial rectus. This can reduce contracture of the medial rectus. It can also hasten the recovery of the paralyzed lateral rectus. Now, if there is a microvascular mononeuropathy, there is no role of steroids. If there is an arteritic cranial nerve palsy, you can give steroids. Most of these resolve spontaneously within three months. So it is best to wait and watch. If it has not resolved, even after six months, you will plan surgery. If you find a stable angle, Again, as I told you before, you do a forced duction test of the antagonist. If it is tight, you can think of recess 
recessing the antagonist muscle. If it is not tight, do a forced generation test. If the forced generation test shows that there is some action of the muscle, you can think of resecting the paralyzed muscle along with recession. If the forced generation test is completely negative, that there is no action on the muscle, you can think of transposition, which can be full tendon, which can be uh, partial tendon, which can be nishidas, where we actually don't, uh, uh, don't uh, um, cut the muscle, we just shift the muscle to the action of the paralyzed muscle, or you can do a vertical rectus transposition. So to conclude, Clinical examination should be documented. Imaging should be ideally be MRI with contrast. You, if you plan surgery, wait for six months and choose the surgery depending on your forced duction and generation test. Thank you. Thank you very much, doc you. Dr. Sujata. It was an excellent presentation and uh, thank you for being on time. Dr. Sandra, uh, your experience on botulinum toxin in paralytic strabismus. So I know you have a lot of experience in botulinum toxin. So which would be cases and how long would you wait before you kind of put plan Botox? Could we give a mic, please? There was a mic here, yeah. Nikor, one more mic here, please. It was there, he's taken it. My Lately, using uh, 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 Botox for the acute comitant esotropias. Uh, earlier, uh, I was using it for lateral rectus palsies. But uh, with regard to the uh, microvascular cases, most of them do resolve uh, uh, fully uh, by uh, two or three months. So I would say the indications would be if uh, based on the job requirements of the person, if they are uh, having to not to miss too many days of work, then I uh, do inject Botox in those patients for a faster recovery because otherwise it is uh, not easy for them, uh, many patients to wait for around uh, three months uh, for the palsy to recover. So I can uh, suggest uh, remeasuring within a gap of a week or 10 days. If there is uh, enough recovery, then you may wait. If there is not, if it is staying at the same, then Botox can be an option. Thank you. So we shall now go on to our next speaker. Dr. Pradeep Sharma, who truly needs no introduction, who was the uh, head of the RP Center of Ophthalmic Sciences in Pediatric Ophthalmic Establishment, Neuro Ophthalmology, Oculoplasty, and now is the uh, lead person in the, these departments in the CFS group of hospitals based in Delhi. And he is going to be talking on evaluation and treatment of nystagmus preferred practice guidelines. Thank you, Dr. Chitra. I would like to thank you for including me in this uh, really select group of uh, people and uh, we are going to talk about preferred practice for evaluation and treatment of nystagmus. Uh, nystagmus as we all know is a rhythmic regular oscillation of the eyes and we know that we are going to de uh, deal with physiologic, pathologic and nystagmoid conditions separately. The physiologic nystagmus we are all aware of optokinetic vestibular and, moid and voluntary nystagmus. Coming to the basic group which we will be mostly dealing with the nystagmus in children which will be in these three categories. The sensory nystagmus in which we need to do an eye examination, fundus, ERG and VER. The second group is the infantile nystagmus, fusional maldevelopment nystagmus and nystagmus blockage syndrome. Here you need to do a extensive eye workup. The third group is spasmus newtons, seesaw nystagmus and vertical nystagmus. In all these three, imaging is mandatory. So the first one is sensory in which there is a pendular nystagmus. Here we should suspect ocular problems, visual problems. So do a proper ocular examination of the retina, fundus, ERG and VER. The second group which was earlier called as motor or manifest nystagmus. These are bilateral conjugate nystagmus happening in early childhood and they have evolved in three phases. Infancy they will be having side to side movement and later on they have a head posture. So that we should find out which way is the head posture and if there is a head uh, turn then we should distinguish an adduction null from an eccentric gaze null. Now how will you know this? If you cover the adducting eye, if he has an adduction null, then it would shift to the other side whereas an eccentric gaze null, he would continue to have the same. Now this individual child, if you see, see here. 
Now he is having the right eye fixing. You cover this eye. Gradually he will just turn his head to the other side. So this is a must and this distinguishes a basic thing for your surgery. The manifest latent nystagmus may have associated strabismus and in these cases you should know that they may be IDS or an infantile esotropia. Correcting the squint itself is in a way a great step in the correction of nystagmus. The examination of nystagmus, so look for the head posture for distance and near both. It may vary, so periodic alternate nystagmus should be kept in mind. Associated squint should be looked for and any associated condition like albinism should be looked. So the important points in nystagmus, AHP, the type of nystagmus, whether it's pendular jerk, right beating jerk or left beating or up and down beating jerk. Is it increasing in abduction gaze? Is it increasing on occlusion of either the right or the left eye? Visual acuity, you need to assess little differently. Binocular as well as monocular, not just routine monocular that you do. If you assess the binocular visual acuity and you find that the vision binocular is much better, you need to reassess your monocular vision after not just uh, covering with occluder, but with a plus four diopter in front of the other eye. Associated strabismus should be looked into. Any associated ocular condition like albinism, any other problem like whether it's an unilateral or asymmetric nystagmus should be known. If there is a face turn, measure it with the protractor or uh, the protractor app on your smartphone. And always watch for periodic alternating stagmas, which means you have to examine the child for consistent five minutes. Spasmus newtons you will pick up when a child is having a torticollis with a f head turn and a disjugate nystagmus. So if there is a unilateral or asymmetric nystagmus, keep in mind it may be spasmus newtons and you need to do an imaging and you will pick up life-saving conditions. So imaging is a must. Uh, any nystagmus which has oscillopsia or acquired, you need to do an imaging. So as a rule, you may have different conditions which are causing it, but you need to do that. Uh, then there is a nystagmus blockage syndrome which you may encounter where you will see a inverse relationship between nystagmus and esotropia. Here uh, you will do a surgery according to that. So how do we manage them? We have to do an optimal prescription, use of tinted glasses, contact lenses do not have any extra control on nystagmus, prisms base out may help control on nystagmus, auditory biofeedback and acupuncture do not have any lasting effects. So this we have studied and we have found. Medical treatment in the form of baclofen for acquired pan has worked but nothing else. Gabapentin has also been used and brinzolamide has been mentioned by some people but it doesn't have much role uh, as far as that. Surgically, yes, they are very gratifying results in correcting the head posture if there is an eccentric null. Artificial divergence surgeries may also help by uh, inducing the uh, 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 divergence. And whenever there is a, a surgery to be done, the preference for us is augmented endosense for up to 30 degrees, like this case, and MR recession of 9 and LR recession of 12 yields the results. If there is a periodic alternating null, you have to do a bilateral augmented endosense or a bilateral horizontal recti, super maximal recessions. Eccentric null with strabismus, you would correct the nystagmus on the dominant eye. So always find out which is the dominant eye because doing a surgery on the non-dominant eye for nystagmus will yield zero results. And strabismus correction can be done on either eye. If there is a head tilt on uh, or thing, then the surgeries would be on the oblique muscles. Uh, finally, I mean, I would come to this conclusion that nystagmus in childhood, you need to investigate if there is a sensory nystagmus for eye examination, fundus and ERG. For uh, the other infantile nystagmus, fusional maldevelopment, you need to find out the AHP and the type of nystagmus. And again, spasmus newtons, seesaw nystagmus and vertical imaging is mandatory. This will save life. And these are the take home points for the surgery that you need to do which type of surgery. This will tell you that cases with definite eccentric null up to 30 degrees, they respond very well to augmented endosens. More than 40 degrees, resections on the opposite muscles have to be added. For pan, you do a bilateral augmented endosense. For fusional maldevelopment nystagmus, correct the squint. That will correct the uh, nystagmus itself. And for the IENA, again the same. No definite yes, null. Yes. Nothing much can be done. Imaging is a must yes. once again. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, excellently covering a very difficult topic uh, very precisely and on time. Uh, just uh, a word on, uh, uh, if you can, sir, on nystagmus with no... Uh, face turn. So, so uh, I mean, your experience in the hurtle de los all or all four recti recessions. So as I said in the last conclusions, when there is no eccentric null, we can try anything and everything. Nothing seems to be working till now. Whether it is a medical treatment, whether it's an acupuncture, or it's the hurtle de loso procedure, which we have published compared with the 
full supra maximal recessions right now nothing yields results more than 3 months you may have a satisfactory thing for 3 months and then the patient will come back to you or somebody else thank you and one more question can i yes. ask what is the ideal time for doing surgeries for face turn i think that is a very good question so because the head posture gets uh, established by about 3 or 4 years so don't be in a hurry to operate before 3 years around 3 or 4 years before school going you can correct these nystagmus with an abnormal head posture thank you very much dr pradeep sharma for an amazing talk we shall now go on to dr sandra ganesh who is a medical consultant pediatric uh, ophthalmology and adult establishment services from arvind eye care uh, systems based at coimbatore and she is going to be talking on managing double trouble a comprehensive guide to diplopia management thank you very much uh, chitra ma'am for the kind invitation yes so i'll be trying to cover the salient aspects of diplopia management in the next 6 uh, minutes, minutes if possible it has to be yes <laughs> we'll switch off the mic just give me a minute for the presentation is still loading thank you and it has to be comprehensive so um deciphering uh, so diplopia is just a perception of two single uh, two images of a single object and it has many uh, potential uh, causes which include both strabismological and neurological etiologies and it's a very huge uh, differential diagnosis so uh, but accurate diagnosis and uh, management can be achieved with a good history and a careful uh, clinical examination and it can be uh, unocular binocular or physiological and initially i think it's very important to see if the patient is using the term double vision correctly because sometimes they can confuse a blurred vision with a double vision so one of the key questions would be to see if the diplo uh, diplopia is present even on the monocular lid closure so this would be the first thing to test and if yes then the patient can have monocular diplopia where there can be more than two images polyopia as it's called where one of the image is usually of normal quality and the rest are of inferior quality so varying reasons of monocular diplopia few including refractive errors uncorrected dry eye corneal disease iris injury cataract media opacities and even primary visual cortex disorders where there can be bilateral monocular diplopia so here the pinhole test would be uh, one of the easier test to start with where you can use a single or a multiple pinhole technique and uh, if it improves with the pinhole then the uh, disease is uh, probably a, a refractive of etiology whereas macular disease is the same or it is usually worsening and the nerve dis uh, disease again remains the same with or without a pinhole so uh, this is uh, just a, a brief recap where uh, with the pinhole if it improves then it is refractive error if it is the same or worse macular disease whereas uh, sometimes it can be regular astigmatism where you have to do further testing on an ampullar grid can also be useful coming to binocular diplopia where the eyes lose their simultaneous alignment uh, in uh, different directions of gaze varying etiologies include uh, cranial nerve pathologies mechanical restriction and neuromuscular transmission disorders uh, we should also remember intermittent or transient diplopia which could be decompensated uh, phorias convergence or divergence insufficiency myasthenia spasm of accommodation and uh, very rare causes like uh, tia uh, superior oblique myokinemia and even cyclic isotropias even after ocular surgery you can have diplopia like following cataract surgery where it can be a decompensated uh, pre existing strabismus or it could be iatrogenic uh, causes like injection of local anesthetic into inferior rectus or injury to superior rectus or post operatively due to a lens tilt or a decentration and post refractive surgery there can be uh, problems with regard to uh, binocular vision anomalies like intermittent strabismus or accommodation issues and sometimes technical uh, issues in the surgery as such post retinal surgery again there are various reasons for uh, causing uh, diplopia including the uh, buckles which are rarely used nowadays uh, damage to recti uh, and uh, by the traction sutures breakdown of pre existing fusion with regard to retinal diplopia usually if there is uh, some uh, like a macular drag and all it's very difficult to treat it so the points in history would be onset progression whether it's constant or intermittent at what time of the day it is occurring whether it's horizontal vertical oblique or diagonal distance or near 
variability with the head posture or with the gaze any previous uh, episodes or uh, whether it is with pain very rarely diplopia can be due to potentially life threatening causes uh, so uh, that uh, in one study it was around 60 per 16% of the diplopia related emergency departmental visits so uh, we have to rule out the rare causes also and a review of the other neurological uh, systems with a thorough history taking and diabetes hypertension recent trauma uh, Graves disease, multiple sclerosis and any other drugs. Uh, look at the old photographs to see if the head posture is long standing or of recent onset and uh, predominantly if there is a face turn it could be because of horizontal recti, predominantly if there is a chin elevation or depression it's vertical recti and if there is a tilt it could be because of the obliques. And uh, coming to evaluation, I think um, uh, Dr. Guha has uh, uh, touched on to it also. And uh, you need to look at deductions, version, sensory testing uh, prior to the motor testing, uh, saccadic velocity, uh, diplopia and head charting, neuroimaging, including an MRA or a CT angiography. The red flags to remember include evolving younger patient, multiple cranial nerves, pupil involvement and disc edema definitely warrants a neuroimaging. Single fiber e EMG is more uh, uh, reliable with regard to myasthenia and orbital imaging or a thyroid function test. So diplopia and head charting has already been detailed. So uh, binocular uh, diplopia examinations, this uh, again uh, just a brief recap. With the cover test, if there is a phoria, it could be causes like uh, decompensating phoria, physiological diplopia or uh, Tropia, if there is, then we need to look at whether it's a horizontal or a vertical, cyclovertical muscles. And if the ductions are abnormal, uh, you will proceed to the forced duction testing as has been detailed again. So the main treatment objective also is to, uh, of diplopia is to create the largest and most uh, central area of the single binocular vision with uh, whatever modalities of occlusion or prisms. If there is in fairly committent uh, deviations, we can try prisms and orthoptic training, Botox or surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sandra, for covering uh, this beautifully with extensive uh, information. Uh, one of the key problems we faced uh, with children coming with diplopia or sometimes not recognizing it so much is the acute comitant esotropia that we've been seeing uh, post-COVID. So in the panel, Dr. Vinita or anyone, what is your approach for a child who presents with a possible suspicion of acute comitant esotropia, especially in these last few months to a year the thing is uh, when the child especially in the post covid period they have been using the computers uh, and the Mike computers check her then. it's off like that okay sure go ahead anyway yeah so when the children are coming these days after post in the post covid era obviously it's a computer based syndrome and their refractive errors have gone unnoticed so the first thing i would proceed is with the refraction depending on the age of the child a cyclopedic refraction is the first thing which i would be doing for those children and accordingly, uh, obviously, whatever is the psychological refraction findings, if it's going for a hyperopic refraction, I'll pres prescribe accordingly and uh, give them the relaxation of the complete accommodation of this for that acute community and is appropriate to resolve. So that's the first uh, approach would be there. And accordingly, after prescription of the glasses, I'll see whether it resolves with that or not. And in case if it's required for so short periods, I may need to even give them binocular, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, bifocal glasses may also be required for some cases for short periods or maybe atrophization for the relief of the ac acute competent phase. Is there a role for these mini surgeries in paralytic establishments? Dr. Dr. Pradeep Sharma. So if there are, sm uh, uh, the person is complaining of diplopia, in such cases which are small angle deviations, you have raised a very nice question, these may require an mini surgeries or adjustable surgeries. Mm -hmm. That is one thing. Secondly, I would like to say, if there is a history of head trauma or a long standing deviation, you need to pre-check with the correction that the diplopia is getting rectified or not. They may have a cortical fusion disruption, which will never get corrected and he will always keep on bothering you. So try to see that, that uh, cortical fusion disruption is also ruled out in long standing deviation. We shall now go on to our next speaker, Dr. Hemalini Saman, uh, who's uh, <coughs> practicing in SRCC Children's Hospital, Dr. Hemalini, yes, <laughs> and uh, again a leading uh, uh, pediatric and neuro-ophthalmologist <coughs> from Mumbai. Uh, she is going to be talking on evaluation of unilateral optic disc edema, I think a very important topic, preferred practice guidelines. I know she is going to shoot off in six minutes. Thank you, Dr. Titra, for inviting me. So the first slide is showing different uh, 
the first slide is showing different pictures of disc edema and looking at the fundus picture, you cannot reach a good diagnosis. So how do you reach a good diagnosis? So certain tips for a good examination. The first and the most important tip is that do not dilate without checking for RAPD. Why am I stressing on this factor is that most of the times, the pupil evaluation and the workup is done by our optometrists who, and by the time the patient comes to you, the patient is already dilated. So therefore, it is very, very important for you to train your optometrist to, to do a good pupillary evaluation. When you're looking at the fundus, look at the perimeter of the disc, look for the obscuration of the blood vessels, L check for the spontaneous venous pulsations, always examine the fellow eye for comparison, it'll give you good clues. Assessing the optic nerve function, I, what I mean to say is always check for color vision. So what I've done is I've trained my optometrist that irrespective of what the history is, color vision is a mandatory part of the examination. Always do a perimetry wherever possible. Again, this point is important because a lot, lot of us think that, okay, if the vision uh, is very less in, in the affected eye, we don't need to do the perimetry, but we still need, need to do the perimetry to document what the situation is in the other eye. OCT, VEP and B-scan neuroimaging are other tools for a good examination. So what are the causes? Uh, with pain, optic neuritis and arthritic AION. Without pain are dysdusin, non-arthritic and neuroretinitis and these are the other causes. My uh, discussion will be restricted to just a few of these causes. So the first case is that of a 65 year old, gradual loss of vision, uh, medical history was diabetes and hypertension. The vision loss was moderate, there was an RAPD, fundus showed a disc edema in the right eye and a crowded disc in the left eye, fields showed an inferior altitudinal defect. So this is what the fundus picture looked like, this is what the corresponding fields will look like. When you see this, you know your diagnosis is anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. What is the preferred practice pattern? Number one, perimetry is very useful to reach your diagnosis. Please remember that there's no role of neuroimaging in these cases. Role of steroids, very, very, very controversial. Um, control, most important thing is control the diabetes, hypertension, refer to the physician. All patients above the, uh, above the age of 50 years old, you must do an ESR and CRP to rule out an arthritic AION. Can treat with aspirin and anticoagulants, but is this going to help an ischemic event in the other eye? Controversial. What is new in AION? What is new in AION is don't treat AIONs with steroids or IV methylprednisolone. Pay more emphasis on correcting the lifestyle factors such as stop smoking, alcohol, regular exercise, good healthy diet, control the sugars and BP. If you come across a patient who has AION, who is progressively losing vision in absence of systemic risk factors, is a moderately obese individual, ask for history of snoring. He could be having an obstructive sleep apnea and if required, you could do a sleep study. The next case is that of a 56 year old, sudden loss of vision. Vision was 624, progressively uh, decreasing. He did complain of headache, but when you have this kind of a patient, he could present with other signs like jaw claudications, fever, joint pains, etc. The ESR and the CRP were high in this patient and the field effect was inferior altitudinal. The uh, diagnosis was an arthritic ARN because he had a chalky white pallor with disc edema. Now, this is a classical appearance, but you could, the appearance of the fundus could be a little different. The preferred practice pattern is that ESR and CRP being high will clinch the diagnosis in most cases. Uh, they may have an increased platelet count also. Should we do a temporal artery biopsy? Well, not necessary in all cases, but can be performed when in doubt. But please make uh, a note that a negative biopsy does not rule out an arthritis. Again, there's no role of neuroimaging except when in doubt and want to rule out an optic neuritis. Treatment is with oral steroids. If doesn't respond, you can shift to other agents, but the visual prognosis is poor in most of the cases. The next case is that of a 30 year old who, whose vision loss was 624, sudden onset. The fundus picture is classical. You see a disc edema with a macular scar, suggestive or, uh, star suggestive of a neuroretinitis. But the thing that you need to remember is that the macular star may take, may be incomplete or may take seven to 10 days for it to fully develop. The preferred practice pattern here is neuroretinitis is never associated with demyelination. The commonest cause in our country is TB, syphilis, sarcoid and toxome. No role of neuroimaging and treat the cause along with steroids. The next case is that of a 32 year old, classic history, high hyperopic, vision is 66, plus 6 was a refractive error. And if you take a look at the fundus picture, it really looked like an elevated disc and one can get mistaken, uh, m mistake this one for a papilledema. So the other investigations that you would perform when in doubt for a dysdrusin would be a perimetry, B scan, autofluorescence, CT scan, uh, OCT. Always look for the spontaneous venous pulsation, although absent in 20% of the normal population, but its presence definitely rules out a papilledema. 
The next case is that of an optic neuritis, which I'm not going to touch on because there's another talk on that. The only thing that I'd like to highlight in optic neuritis patients is that do not do a CT scan to come to your diagnosis. Do not treat these patients with oral steroids, and there's no role of retrobulb by injections of steroids. Thank you. Thank you. That was a wonderful thank, talk. Thank you, Malini. Uh, excellent talk, perfectly on time, covering up the key points that we would want uh, to make. Thank you. Dr. Shikha, uh, for unilateral disc edema to come to a, a kind of diagnosis, how, how much would you use or trust the OCT for? Now we're struggling with uh, ischemic, neuritis. So would OCT give us a little bit of idea before we start uh, you know, planning? Uh, mic. Could you pass the mic? Mr. Excuse me, one more mic you can uh, give. No, he's given. Hey, hey. Research phase, but very subtle things uh, can help us in differentiating between most of the time the uh, DDs are uh, the ischemic optic neuropathy, neuritis, and a uh, disc drusen, and uh, that is pseudopapilledema. So drusen, obviously, now with the consortium showing what the drusen looks like, if it's there, um, and sometimes you can have drusen and ischemic optic neuropathy. So you can, you know, it can tilt the diagnosis towards one side. Whereas in, um, if there is presence of subfobial fluid along with that, then again, it, you know, tilts the diagnosis towards uh, ischemic optic neuropathy. And uh, in case of uh, uh, optic neuritis, sometimes the other eye also will show, you know, some thinning. Okay. So definitely it can be used, you know, but uh, you can't do an OCT and tell that, uh, you know, th that shouldn't be your mainstay. The main thing should be the clinical evaluation history and everything, but it adds, it, it, uh, you, uh, it gives you extra information. I'd say. Can papilledema be an asymmetric presentation? Yes, the drusen yes, sometimes. Okay, he's yeah. talking. So I'm sure uh, Rashmi will cover <laughs> sorry, that sorry. up wonderfully. Sorry, sorry, Thank sorry. you, Dr. Shikha, and I hope more research that you're doing in on an OCT yeah. will help us make our life easier, which is getting very difficult now. But We go on to inviting Dr. Rashmin Gandhi, again, a very leading neuro-ophthalmologist of the country and with international uh, status too, who is going to be talking on evaluation of bilateral optic disc edema, preferred practice guidelines. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Chitra and uh, Team ARC for inviting me here. And thank you, Dr. Chitra, for not stealing my thunder because <laughs> I'm going to talk on papilledema. <laughs> so uh, um, I'm going to talk about bilateral disc edema. The question that you ask yourself in preferred practice pattern is, is it just an elevated disc, a disc which looks uh, edematous? Is it unilateral or bilateral? And unilateral has been covered extensively by uh, HEMA. Perform optic nerve function test. And then three important points. Uh, are these discs swollen because of optic nerve problem? Is the problem coming from above or problem coming from below? Uh, so this is uh, an example, uh, a representative case of a 28-year-old female, a uh, little overweight. Uh, she complains of uh, gradual decreased vision over a period of six to eight weeks associated with the headaches. And this is how her optic nerves look like. So there is uh, a bilateral disc edema in a, uh, in a relatively young female. Uh, the first thing is to rule out papilledema. And how do we do that? How do we investigate papilledema? A complete, and as was emphasized in all the talks, a complete uh, neurological and neuroophthalmic history examination, check blood pressure because uh, hypertensive retinopathy can mimic uh, some of these problems. Neuroimaging, MRI, plus minus MRV, it's important to rule out uh, venous sinus thrombosis. And the confirmatory diagnosis of raised intraclinic pressure would be uh, lumbar puncture, uh, opening pressure, and composition, and this will be done by neurologist. So what about the history? What are the points in history? And this is uh, uh, important. We know that raised intraclinic pressure, patient would complain of headache. But some of the other uh, important contributory symptoms would be tinnitus. Patient may complain of whooshing sound in the ear uh, when he has uh, increased uh, intraclinic pressure and a transient visual obscuration. Now, the characteristic of uh, transient visual obscuration in raised intraclinal pressure is one, it lasts for a few seconds. This is in, uh, in contrast to TVOs which come because of the vascular problem, which generally lasts for a few minutes. They are generally posture related, uh, generally seen when the patient gets up from a lying or a sitting down position. And the third characteristic of TVO in raised ICP when present would be browning out of vision. Generally, uh, the, the 
vascular TVOs would be blackouts here patient may tell you that everything appears a little brown for a while before it settles down uh, patient can develop optic neuropathy when the papilledema is not treated when it becomes chronic and that's where the optic nerve function uh, goes down so these are about the history points uh, when would you label uh, a raised ICP as IIH when you document that there is an increased intracranial pressure uh, as uh, Dr. Chitra was mentioned papilledema is a, a a general presentation it can be asymmetric it can be unilateral and it depends upon uh, the local anatomical changes around the optic nerve sheath MRI MRV and CT scan or, or CT scan should be normal and the CSF should be normal except for elevated pressure what are the treatment option when you have a raised ICP because of uh, IIH observation uh, in a very few patient you may observe and it can go down otherwise Weight loss is an important contribution to uh, decreasing uh, intracranial pressure. The general dictum is that uh, whenever the patient presents, 20% weight loss from that day within six months would really reduce either the need for acetazolamide and re will reduce the pressure. Acetazolamide remains the mainstay, uh, the mainstay of the medical treatment of raised ICP. And the surgical options would be optic nerve sheath fenestration or the shunt procedure. Uh, if the main problem is progressive vision loss, then optic nerve sheath fenestration probably would be a, a, a surgical procedure to go to. And if the main problem is uh, headaches, then the uh, and intractable headache uh, not resolved by the medical treatment, then the shunt procedure would be the treatment to go to. Bilateral disc edema, not papilledema, uh, as I mentioned, hypertensive retinopathy, sleep apnea, or uh, disc swelling, which predominantly uh, the conditions which are predominantly unilateral but sometimes can be bilateral. Some more examples of uh, bilateral disc edema. This is uh, a myelinated nerve fiber which can sometimes mimic or get confused with uh, true disc edema or baridrusin which uh, Hema touched upon. So these are the features of a pseudo papilledema or a pseudo disc edema. Generally patient would have a congenitally an anomalous disc which is small they can be small or absent cup. Uh, you can see some anomalies in, in the branching of the vessels. Uh, sometimes the drusen can be visible on the surface of the optic nerve. Example of uh, hypertensive retinopathy presenting as bilateral disc edema, uh, malignant hypertension. Uh, a, a trick here is to look at uh, all the features and in hypertensive retinopathy you'll find one, the vascular changes, AV crossing changes and you'll find the problems which are away from the optic disc. If it's a papilledema, generally you'll find that the hemorrhages, hard axillaries, everything is around the optic disc. While here, you'll find cortical spots and hemorrhages which are away from the uh, optic disc. Sometimes a very small disc can be confused with uh, a papilledema or a disc edema. Uh, example being hypoplastic disc. I'll end with this patient, a 10-year-old female who came to us with reduced vision for last four months. Uh, she had seen uh, a neurologist and she was on uh, Diamox, but she was still uh, losing vision. Uh, as you see here, there is uh, uh, surely uh, blurring of disc margin even now. But what was missed at that point was these uh, abandoned uh, vitreous cells. Patient actually had bilateral pass pulmonitis and the vision loss was because of bilateral CME. So always make sure that while we are talking about raised ICP and hepatitis retinopathy, UVIT conditions can also lead to bilateral disc edema and a thorough uh, stick lamp examination is must. So to conclude, um, Elevated disc, optic nerve function test, look at blood vessel and retina carefully, rule out uveitis and look at systemic association. These are uh, common uh, conditions that you look at when you see a patient with bilateral disc edema. I thank you once again. Thank you, Dr. Rashman. Excellently covering uh, bilateral disc edema and the key features uh, helping us to understand uh, papilledema. Uh, panel expert panel, I would just want to ask about indications and experience with optic nerve sheet fenestration. So, Virinder, Dr. Shikha, Dr. Padmavati, uh, any experience? When would you intervene, and how do you, you know, would think ONSF would be? Right now at Netralia, uh, fenestration is considered for case for fulminant cases of IIH, uh, mm -hmm. where the uh, medical uh, we the patient is losing vision uh, despite the medical treatment, and uh, we have to decide about uh, you know a quick surgical uh, option. So in those cases, we are considering. Yeah. Uh, usually. Uh, when you have a severe vision loss and there is a progressive vision loss, you think of uh, doing a fenestration. Yeah, very there.
how aggressively are you for the surgery? I mean, even in 6-6 with progressive field effect, would you consider ONSF? Uh, if not considering, then consider a trial for a week or 10 days if it is... Yeah, I mean, of course, yeah. after full trial of full medical ma ma med management, of course. Then we we'll consider definite surgery. So even in 6-6, six, six, you now think the surgery is safe enough uh, not to worry about uh, any damage to the visual system by your surgical process? I think the field is most sensitive. Sure. <laughs> uh, thanks. Thank, thank you, Virinder. Thank, thank you for you, having this confidence in uh, the thanks surgery. Thanks, Dr. Ashwin, for the opportunity. Wish you a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chief of Neuros uh, of the Health Services at Arvind Eye Hospital, Thirnal Veli, and a very admirable clinician. And let's hear her pearls for preferred practice guidelines. Of Thank the you, Dr. Chitra, ma'am. Thank you for including me in this ARC session. I think there was a bit confusion in the topic. It's okay. I'm sorry, Dr. Rohit, if I have stolen yeah. your show. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. The topic assigned to me was optic neuritis management then and now. If everyone knows optic neuritis is uh, inflammation of the optic nerve head. The, uh, as everyone knows, the typical optic neuritis is a female preponderance affecting 15 to 45 years of age with an acute onset of vision loss, usually unilaterally. But these cases, they have an improvement in the visual acuity even after four weeks of the onset of symptoms. The classical uh, thing which you think about the typical optic neuritis is it could be an idiopathy or it could be a clinically isolated or it could be a demyelinating event. And these are the precursors of multiple sclerosis. When what happens when anything doesn't fit into the typical features, you have the spectrum of atypical optic neuritis where the age of presentation doesn't fit into the prescribed category. There is no pain. There is progressive loss of vision. This could be bilateral. The fundus features could be atypical features and moreover, these could be bilateral as well as recurrent and you have a poor visual prognosis. What fits into this spectrum of atypical optic neuritis is your demyelinating uh, CNS disorders, namely the uh, neuromyelitis optica, myelin oligodendrocyte optic neuritis, infectious as well as your inflammatory. So I'm not moving on to the how do you distinguish an uh, MS optic neuritis, how, how do you differentiate a MOG optic neuritis because that was covered yesterday. Going on to the examination, the visual acuity has to be documented at every visit and preferably in the log mark. An anterior segment examination to document if it is an unilateral, an RAPD, if it is bilateral, carefully examine the other pupil also for an afferent pupillary defect. The contrast sensitivity has to be documented in all cases of vision loss because sometimes you could have a 6-6 optic neuritis. The next is your color vision uh, testing which is mandatory for all neuroophthalmic cases. The red desaturation, sometimes your color vision could be normal, but still go for the red uh, color test and uh, evaluate whether the uh, patient has a red desaturation. The posterior segment examination is also mandatory with indirect ophthalmoscope. The common presentation in a typical optic neuritis, it, the fundus could be normal where it is called as a retrobulbar optic neuritis or you could have a disc edema which you call that as a papillitis. The disc edema is always minimal with a hyperemia. You don't have much exudative changes in these cases with a minimal peripheral uh, uh, RNFL hemorrhages. So when you come to the investigations, automated perimetry is mandatory in all these cases. The role of pattern VEP is always a controversy, but in cases of MS, you do, it is a subclinical marker whether the other eye is involved, just like how you do an OCT. The next thing is the serum uh, NMO and MOG antibody has to be done in all cases of optic neuritis. A contrast enhanced MRI brain on orbits is also mandatory for all these cases. OCT can help you to aid in your diagnosis of NMO and MS associated because the rate of thinning is different in these cases. CSF analysis is for cases where you have an infection as your etiology. Cases of atypical optic neuritis, blood investigations are mandatory. You have to go for a complete blood count, RA factor, syphilis, 
all these blood investigations are needed. I'm sorry, the, manage, the topic is management. So you have to give IV methyl prednisolone for three consecutive days, followed by oral steroid in all these cases for 11 days. This is based on the ONTT landmark trial, which complained, compared three treatment modalities. One is the IV steroids versus oral steroids versus placebo. What they saw was this fastened the recovery of optic neuritis and delayed the conversion of multiple sclerosis. In cases of uh, MOG associated optic neuritis and chronic relapsing inflammatory optic neuritis, you have to give the, after you give the methylprednisolone, you have to maintain these cases on oral steroid for more than six to eight weeks. In cases of NMOSD, where you don't have a good response with the IV methylprednisolone, before you have to establish the diagnosis that this case is an NMO before considering plasma exchange. If you see the plasma exchange is done for rela uh, relapse remitting multiple sclerosis, NMO, steroid refractory optic neuritis. Intravenous immunoglobulins in cases of acute management is always a bit controversial. It is used in remit uh, RRMS and also in reduced incidence of second attack of multiple sclerosis. Immunomodulators, this act in Cl uh, clinical definite multiple sclerosis. The long-term management cases of multiple sclerosis, you need to use a disease modifying agents, that is the interferons, based on your clinical trials like your CHAMS, PRISMS, okay, for the benefit for, uh, for the, in, uh, how the clinical definite multiple sclerosis progresses or not. The immunomodulators are considered in these cases also, and the monoclonal uh, antibody here is a natalizumab. In case of NMOSG, you, the first line of management is azathioprine, where you have to uh, give in the dosage of 3 milligram per kg per day with concurrent uh, prednisolone uh, after the azathioprine takes effect. If the patient is not comfortable with azathioprine, you can consider mycophenolate morphetine. In cases of MOG associated optic neuritis, you have to, the, usually these are steroid responders. You have to maintain them on uh, oral steroids for a few weeks, followed by the immunosuppressants. These immunosuppressants should be maintained at least for three months. In cases associated with systemic inflammatory disease, it is a disease specific therapy. So you have to treat according to the etiology. SLE usually responds better to cyclophosphamide, while sar sarcoidosis could be treated with isothioprine. This is one entity, GFAP, that is a glial fibrillary acidic uh, protein. This responds to steroids, and you, in cases of relapse, you treat it with immunosuppressant. So when you have a case of acute optic neuritis, identify whether it is a seropositive or a seronegative, and treat accordingly with a high dose of IV methyl prednisolone, if needed, go for a plasma exchange. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, thank Dr. You, Dr. Thank you. A difficult topic, uh, definitely, something that is still confusing and plaguing all of us. Moreover, one thing I would like to add is most of us stop, start with the methyl prednisolone. The next line of management is usually in concurrence with the neurologist. So yeah. how your neurologist says, that is how the treatment moves on. And essentially now one would say that a baseline MRI is virtually an essential component of your workup. Just like your clinical workup, the MRI is now adding so much to our understanding and our dividing these cases into the two, three various components. I think it is now becoming an essential feature of uh, your basic workup for optic neuritis. So uh, thank one you. One more word is you are not supposed to give interference if you yes, think that it case is of NMOSG yes. because it works the other ways. Could you connect his presentation? E exactly. Thank you very so much, Dr. Padmavati. We now <coughs> shall go on to Dr. Virendra Sachdeva, who is a consultant pediatric ophthalmology, strabismus and neuro ophthalmology from the LV Prasad Institute at Vishakapatnam. And he's going to tell us on a very interesting uh, topic, very relevant to us today, COVID-19 and neuro-ophthalmology, what every ophthalmologist needs to know. On to you, Dr. Virendra Sachdeva. Thank you very much, Dr. Chitra. Uh, nice to see all of you after the webinar days. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, COVID pandemic has actually uh, 
controlled a lot of things for all of us in the last two years and uh, neuro-ophthalmology is not an exception. There have been lot of reports that tell that the neuro-ophthalmological manifestations could range from minor ones such as headache to very severe ones with uh, diffuse ophthalmoplegia and complete vision loss and acquired nystagmus. So we can subclassify them into afferent and efferent ones such as optic neuritis, optic perineuritis, acute ischemic strokes and some of the efferent examples being isolated cranial palsies or even diffuse ophthalmoplegia and few interesting reports of AIDS people. So why is it so? Uh, why CNS is a site of predilection? It's possibly because that uh, there is a two-way mechanism that is well established why the virus can spread to the brain. One is along the vagus and olfactory nerves and second one, the more common one is likely the hematogenous where the virus gains entry into bloodstream and the breakdown of blood brain barrier allows access to the brain. And there is plenty of the ACE2 receptors over there. I'm sorry for the typo. ACE2 receptors over there which allow the expression and damage. And there are well reported mechanisms of damage which are either one of the three, either a direct damage or an inflammatory response that is heightened by the um, body's response such as hypercoagulable state being activated and third being uh, immune mediated mechanisms. This is important in the context of the fact that all the three different can have presentation at different times. For example, a direct invasion will usually cause a manifestation within one week to 10 days. A uh, post-viral inflammatory syndrome, uh, a immune mediated mechanism will take some time, maybe three weeks to four weeks to manifest and hypercoagulable states happen during the hyperinflammatory phase of the infection like we saw in the second wave uh, very prominently in the strokes and CSE it is manifesting in the one to two weeks. So what is important for all of us, what uh, all of us should know is that how do you establish that it is secondary to COVID infection? Often it is a presumed thing. It is difficult to say that it is definitely due to COVID. So it remains a diagnosis of exclusion. What is most important is to follow the four points or the tetrad of establishing the temporal profile as we saw in the previous slide. Explainable pathophysiology. Can it match with the mechanism like a stroke matching with the hypercoagulable state in the body? Ruling out other likely causes. A patient presenting with a mononeuropathy, but you have ruled out all the vasculopathic risk factors. You have ruled out other things. I'll show some examples for that. And can it establish as a trigger mechanism for this manifestation? Similar thing does apply to the COVID vaccines, though it is less reported from India, but there are well established reports with both AstraZeneca and Pfizer vaccines or different bases of vaccines. So I'll just take some examples to establish and what can we do as the current understanding for the management of these patients. Optic neuritis is one of the most common reported mechanism, uh, manifestations, sorry, and there are reports of bilateral, unilateral optic neuritis, uh, optic neuritis along with retinitis as well, which makes it difficult to understand whether it's a demyelination or not. And the reports show that treatment even with IV steroids and long-term steroids have led to incomplete visual recovery in majority of patients. So in our experience, we have seen that the age group of these patients is similar. There is no gender bias and uh, they might manifest even in older patients. If we look at the visual acuity, it can range anywhere from no light perception to 2020 and manifestation can be with this swelling uh, such as papillitis, retrobulbar optic neuritis or pallor suggesting that it could be a recurrence in a previously affected eye. MRI might show evidence of demyelination in the optic nerve, might show a slight enhancement of the optic nerve sheath or maybe totally normal. So what is the serological workup we have obtained? It show we did look up for the NMO MOG in all patients and only one showed a positivity out of 13. And visual recovery, though majority of patients had visual outcome above 2040, the a significant number of patients remained poor. So what we take from the previous presentation about workup of optic neuritis, MRI brain and orbits is necessary, serology is necessary, CSF analysis might be important to rule out other infections, though we normally defer it for this, but if you can do it and you can establish the uh, virus in the PCR from CSF, it might be establishing a etiology, but we need to rule out other infectious etiology and correlate with the time course as I said before. 
so this would be the suggested workup in addition to the pre uh, previous uh, presentation do a csf analysis look for esr crp if you have other uh, cl uh, clues possibly look for serum maze d dimer may or may not be relevant to this but you will treat with iv steroids with prolonged taper of steroids rather than a short course of steroids strokes have been one of the most uh, common manifestations in neurology uh, wards and uh, this is an example of a 76 year old gentleman who presented with a sequential vision loss in both eyes after an uh, episode of covid infection you see the infection was moderately severe esr was 90 the eco lft other things were normal and crp was also elevated suggesting that hyper immune response was playing a role in this kind of patient and we can see the ct and mri brain showing bilateral occipital lobe strokes causing the vision loss so there are some important clues which have been established for covid and stroke majority of the patients present within 21 days majority within 10 days and it can happen even in young there can be multiple territories which can get affected it can be large vasal occlusion which is uncommon and it can happen as a de novo presentation in a patient without any vasculopathic risk factors so we look for the um, lab markers which can correlate with the pathophysiology elevated c-reactive protein d dimers and elevated antiphospholipid antibodies which are common in these patients and the management will include early anticoagulation especially when the patient's immune phase is going up like fifth to seventh day of infection we look for elevated d dimers and start early anticoagulation and con continue it for a long time to prevent another episode this is a report uh, from our institute showing COVID INO as a presenting manifestation of COVID-19. And last example of a patient with a cranial nerve palsy. This is a 46 year old gentleman presented with acute right onset diplopia. We can see minus three limitation of abduction in right eye. And there was no other neurological event, no other things. Uh, uh, extensive workup with MRI brain and orbits showing no lesion at orbital apex. LR muscle is normal. There is no enhancement along the nerve suggesting it's difficult to establish a etiology but the vasculopathic risk factor was also uh, normal the only thing was esr was elevated for the patient's age and going back we found that the history of being vaccinated with the second dose of covid vaccine and the onset of symptoms three days later was the only possible clue we treated the patient with oral steroids and it did improve though I do not say that all patients will improve with steroids, but this is one possible thing you can do in view of elevated lab markers. We need to do extensive workup and can manage with steroids and botulinum toxin. So in summary, it's difficult to give preferred practice guidelines, but we need to be aware that it can ha COVID can have different manifestations, some of the most common ones that we see. So we keep it high in our differential diagnosis after a COVID infection or a COVID-19 vaccination. We need to look for the temporal profile, look for pathophysiological biomarkers. We exclude other etiologies and look whether it could act as a precipitating factor. Thank you very much. For the time. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Virinder. Excellent coverage. Um, very, very enlightening talk. Uh, Dr. Rashmin, in this and, setting uh, of COVID. Thank you very much. Your, he has written in that uh, CME series also on COVID. Yes. And, and I do yes. hope uh, you all read it. I don't <laughs> mind resending <laughs> it to all of you. Yes. done a great job of it. <coughs> yeah, Dr. Rashman, I was just asking in this setting of COVID in the background, have, would you be altering your interventions like steroids, disease-modifying agents, interferons? So sometimes uh, there is a history of COVID or vaccination. Would you be altering uh, your management profile as of now what is established for any of the neuroophthalmological diseases? So there are, there are two things, right? One, as Varinder mentioned, uh, optic neuritis, where you, we really don't know anything else is happening and there is a history of COVID. They might require a longer, longer course of steroids than usual. So uh, oral taper would be slower than usual. And there is a thought uh, that maybe these patients have a high propensity to develop mog related uh, optic neuritis. So then they will require the management according to mog. MOG has been uh, shown to be associated uh, post-COVID and in that case we know that the uh, cause of immunosuppression at least for uh, a few months after that that's required. 
otherwise i don't think so it's a it's a really big question you know uh, getting the association yeah. est- uh, established particularly so uh, i mean interferons i would be like steroids we still are uh, you know we still have not altered but i was just wondering that patients of optic neuritis mri showing changes on the mri suggestive of uh, maybe likelihood of ms in the long term how aggressively would you push uh, you know interferons uh, or disease modifying agents per se for uh, for them so uh, because that may you know especially with so much news going on information going on long covid and its effects so would there be an alteration in your interventions may i add here uh, <coughs> yeah, there is a very that. very nice article that came last year from uh, dr neil miller sorry dr prem subramanian's group hmm. so from their university they analyzed the patients and the uh, guidelines also came what should be done for immunosuppression there is no need to change the immunosuppression for a given patient they continued and there were no adverse events uh, only yeah. few things were like we don't try to start cyclophosphamide new or if cyclophosphamide can be shifted it's better because it can lead to more risk of uh, recurrence sorry uh, uh, secondary infections and we if a patient is myasthenia uh, so if we can avoid starting the s- steroids and disease modifying drugs in the face of covid pandemic then they can do better that these are the two things they suggest rest yeah. all we can continue yeah I, as of now i think internationally there has been no change i my only concern has been of course now thankfully we don't we are off the past the mucomycosis uh, massive upstroke in uh, we seen we saw <laughs> the only catch at that time was uh, you know giving steroids and particularly long term steroids in patients with the optic neuritis or those which uh, have not responded so that was my only worry and that was the only time when we had yes. uh, altered our dosage duration of steroids but as as virinder says as of now i think there is no evidence that we should alter uh, our interventions for neuroophthalmological disorders uh, based on whatever currently the evidence is there thank you very much i thank you uh, one and all <coughs> of you in the expert panel for your contribution and thank you dear audience and thank you speakers thank it was really a treat to hear all of you and see you in person i'm sure i'll be in touch with you all again again through my webinars thank you again thank you thank for you. participating in the arc sessions now and throughout the year yes. they have been very popular because of the experts that yes. we've had with us thank you very no, much it's been popular because of all of you thank you photograph with you